I don't know if I really need this, but I think it does help some. I'd like to introduce Mr. Richard Haig. Most of you met Dick this afternoon, but for those of you who have not, Mr. Haig is from Seattle, Washington, landscape architect in Seattle. He started the LA program at the University of Washington and uh, has been uh, since uh, leaving that position, concentrating his full energies on professional practice in Seattle with part-time teaching at the university. He's a graduate of Berkeley and has his MLA from Harvard, was employed in the San Francisco area with Halprin, and uh, then went north to start the program at Seattle. So. Let's hear it for Rich Haig. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, John. I'm delighted to be here and uh, a little bit exhausted, frankly, and all. But uh, I think once once I start in this, the adrenaline will start flowing again because this is my uh, favorite, most favorite project. It's a bit unusual. I think the approach is unusual. The subject I had uh, a city agency as a client. And uh, one of the things I mentioned this afternoon you should always do, though, is ask yourself, who is the ultimate client of this project? And uh, so this, this is a real problem for a designer, because I was thinking about the generations that are not yet born and uh, how their play styles would be evolving and changing. And yet I have to work right with the politicians. And the mayor is on a four-year treadmill. And I did have some real advantages in going into this project, however. One of these was the fact that I had about three years lead time, three years before the site actually became the property of the city of Seattle. Uh, you should come out to Seattle. We have a uh, fantastic park system going there and uh, some very, very fine design done by uh, many, many firms. Well, a few things I should, well, let's just start with the slides, right? Put you all to sleep and you can relax. And uh, this, this is a technique that I actually uh, used to uh, sell these ideas, this approach. Oh, I cut him unawares. I said, there we go. Uh, could, you, could we back, back them up to uh, the first, first position in both reels, please? Is that the first position? I forgot. Must be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it, I think. I, I think that's it. What we have here, you can be looking at these pictures while I talk. This, let's see here, just a minute. That is the site itself right there. And it's in the context, downtown, uh, downtown Seattle is here. The Seattle Center, 74 acres where the World's Fair was held in 1962. And I did most of the remodeling of that particular site. Here is the site as seen in this oblique. Uh, this is after after some demolition, though, as you'll see. Here's downtown Seattle. The Olympic Mountains are here. The Cascades are here. Salt water is there, and fresh water is here. Uh, Lake Lake Washington. So that gives you some idea of the context. Now, a bit of history, just a few facts. This uh, site was obtained. In 1906, by a gas company to manufacture from coal first and then crude oil, what they called illuminating gas. It was not used for heating 
cooking or anything like that. It was just used for light. We had all the sawdust and wood for cooking and, and heat and so on. Uh, at that time, this was more of a bog than it was a lake. The uh, University of Washington lies right in here, just a mile, a little over a mile away. There's our site again. Here it is here. The fact is that when they cleared the site for the, the Alaska, Alaska Yukon Exposition, in 1909, that was held. When they cleared that site in 1907, they, they uh, killed a bear. A bear was hibernating in a log there. So this was pretty wild and forested. This was not a lake. It was a bog with a stream moving through it. And it was in 1917 that the government locks were built, and this water level was raised 11 feet, and this became a, a true lake, and was called Lake Union because it was the union between salt and fresh water. Some more views of the site. Uh, these were giant gas holding tanks, and later you will see some photographs of these, and I put up a fight to save this gas holding tank here. We'll see that later. So let's see, we were at 1917 or so when they started bringing oil in by, by ocean going uh, ship then. Then the plant uh, flourished, uh, the, the population grew, and they began to pump oil, th uh, gas, 30 miles out in all directions. They had crews working here around the clock. I, they produced over a million cubic feet of, of gas a day. Then the war came, Second World War, and the Navy took over the plant and began to produce explosives and exotic chemicals. Then the gas company operated the plant until the year 1956, and at that time, natural gas was brought in from uh, Texas and from uh, Canada, Alberta, so overnight the plant became obsolete, a derelict, grotesque derelict plant. These are some of the buildings there. In 1963, the city had the idea of buying, acquiring this site as a future park. And they began making payments of $133,000 a year for 10 years. One of the conditions of uh, turning the site over to the city of Seattle was, was that the site had to be cleared. Everything cleared off of the site, turned over as a flat level plain. In 1963, this was in the news, I was, my department was just beginning to grow and I used this as a landscape exchange problem for junior grade students, junior year students. It was sent to, as I remember, about 13 schools across the country. We had about 130 entries. Every one of those entries showed, uh, and incidentally, I write very loose programs, you know, like, uh, you are the czar of the site. What would you do with it? What is its highest and best use? And we had a lot of Sid Sydney Opera Houses that year because that had just won the uh, Sydney Opera House, that orange peel design, you know. And we had many zoos and uh, uh, Olympic Games Center, uh, uh, junior colleges, a lot of things like that. Anyhow, of the 130 entries, not one student opted to save anything on that site. And I must tell this on myself because I didn't think that was strange at all. It didn't occur to me in 1963 to <clears throat> that anything was worth saving or recycling. <clears throat> so in 1970, in the summer, I was awarded the commission to design this park, a park on this site. There had been some previous designs by the park, in-house park people, and they were always uh, rose gardens with little pools and reflecting globes, benches, gravel paths, you know, the kind of thing. And uh, there was a group of people headed by a very wealthy labor, uh, lumber baroness, who was determined that this 20-acre site would be converted into a mini in-town, in-city 
northwest temperate zone rainforest. You know, two or three feet of forest duff, you know, the moss, the mushrooms, the mycology, all of that. And uh, she was rather upset that I got this commission because we never have been able to understand each other. But I went, I began to haunt the site, literally. I got a sleeping bag and I began to sleep around in the various buildings and on the platforms and the towers. I always look for the spirit of the site, and I usually find it in such sacred things as uh, group stone outcropping, springs, of course, and trees and plants. I'm an eco-freak, and here I am given this ghost plant to deal with. Well, I still ask myself, what is the most sacred thing on this site, though? What is it? Is it a relationship? It is a spirit? What? And I found it to be in the complexity, the scale, the, uh, I began to, I had a, began a love affair with these towers, the gas generating towers and the buildings and the relationships. And it is still, even today, so complex that every time I go, I, I discover new spatial, visual relationships. This is just to show you how it had been before 1906 and very high on a, on a natural scale and then how it uh, was just a few, in a few years' time. So I thought this would be, make one hell of a monument for man's degradation of his environment. Yes? Oh, yes, thank you. You, you can see here uh, that this site is, is completely man-made. There is no natural soil left. And they built a huge building up here on the campus, and they took the sub-basements and they dumped it on top of this oil. And uh, that is what we call Vashon Till. It is a glacial cemented soil, which is uh, very, very sterile. And I, I resented having that dumped on the site because I, I thought there was graft, somebody was paying somebody off, and so on. But I even uh, grew to like that, and that became the idea of for, and the base for a great mound. So I, be, I began to uh, try to uh, have an open mind and look for hidden beauty and all, and I thought, there's not that much difference, is there? You squint your eyes, squint your eyes. All slicks can be beautiful, and uh, these at least can be. I think the asphalt parking lots, which are permanent oil slicks, and don't have the potential of this kind of beauty. And I never saw the plant when it was operating, but I think it must have been a very Turner-esque view for the, the homesteaders up on the hill to look out across the lake and to see this in the early morning light. I have seen a Navy documentary film, and it looks like hell's fire itself, Hades, Dante's Inferno, where the, the furnace is all going. They had many explosions there, many oil spills, this was all before uh, 1956, you see, before we had any kind of environmental or uh, ecologic controls. Uh, I want the, hard, the difficult thing to bring a, get across to you, I've got to work on this aspect more, is the fact that this whole idea was very controversial to save anything on the site. The mayor had run on a platform of uh, converting this site into a park. The mayor was born and raised downwind from this plant. So his parents, along with the other residents, they'd have to paint their houses every year. The curtains, they just gave up on curtains. The canaries had a very short life. And the, I thought, these people have really suffered brain damage, and I'll have a difficult time dealing with them to, to uh, educate them, expand their levels of consciousness, and bring them around. So I teamed up, I had a, a guru, guru, a philosopher, who was all through counterculture, the, all through the drug scene and that, but he had a degree in law, a degree in divinity, and a degree in philosophy. So his credentials were impeccable, right? I could take him to the city council, even in his robes. And I told him that I had this very special problem and I didn't know exactly how to approach it. And I was interested in counterculture. I was frightened by very many of the manifestations. At the same time, I thought there were some real lessons that the young people were trying to tell us something. What was it? Of, what was their value? Evolving play styles. 
people were beginning to play in the streets. And uh, how that, for the first time in Western civilization, we had actually moved from a work ethic to a play ethic. This is, this is a fact. You have to realize that. So I'm designing this park for future generations. What, how do I go about that? And Adrian, uh, he couldn't believe I was for real. And I, well, I met him in this health food store. This meeting was set up, very clandestine meeting. I meet him in his bedroom in a, behind a health food store and a candle is burning. And he takes my hand and he holds it for an interminable length of time, you know. And I'm getting real nervous, so I start to light up. And he says, oh, please, my son, your body is your temple, you know. So I thought, oh, what am I into now? Anyhow, I took him down there, and we climbed up on those towers in a storm. And his robes were just flapping. I thought he's going to sail off over the hill. But he came down, and he said, this is a very sacred and special place. You're going to need all the help you can get. You can't afford to alienate anyone. And you must bring, as you did me, you must bring people down here, get them into it. So. I asked the gas company, and they said, sure, take any building you want. So I chose the blacksmith shop, and we took out six semi-truckloads of furnaces and soot and everything, and we painted it white, just as any architect would do, right? Bone white, and hung up some cheap plastic banners, and had our meetings there, all of our meetings. We first had a great party there, a New Year's Eve party, and we invited the officials and all of the uh, women in landscape architecture came down as hostesses. Pretty chauvinistic thing to do, but it works. And we had 20 gallons of red and 20 gallons of white and turkeys and hams, and, and then the gas company people came in with their hard hats and they ran us all out, like the Gestapo. They said, you know, you don't even have a banquet permit. What is this, Hag? What are you doing? So then we went over to my office and had the real party. Well, we, as designers, you have to establish a certain level of credibility, and there are certain rules and, and ways this is done. This is one of them, is to prepare drawings and maps and two-dimensional material. Inventory the site, what are the resources, what are the uh, forces acting upon it, what is the context. Now, well, already by this time, after I had the office there and began to work and keep it open so the public was invited in, I began to, uh, I had the solution. I, I had the vision already. So this is a strange case where the solution be comes before the studies. And you can do that. It happens. But you still go through this kind of uh, ritual. and. Uh, we made, what is that, 11 plates or something like that. And here's one on open space. This is another bit of advice. When, and you know this, when you have a project, you think about across the street, across the block, you always try to expand your sphere of influence, right? So here we're trying to get the whole lake, you see. And we're looking at the other parks around there. As, uh, Here's its relationship to Seattle Center, 74 acres. That's an Olmstead Park of 40 acres. And I, I remodeled that park. Here's Gas Works. The thing is, we are trying to make a case for having a very special park here because the Arboretum Committee is breathing on us heavy. Let's get everything torn down. Let's start uh, reconditioning the soil or bringing in soil. Let's get the plants planted. You know, what's all, what are you doing to us? Well, fortunately, I have worked on many of these older parks. They go back to the early 1900s, the Olmsted Office Legacy. We have a rich heritage of these post-Victorian parks that are quite mature, quite beautiful, and believe it or not, quite fragile. When we began to have rock festivals, those large social gatherings, uh, the uh, amped up music and all the wild things going on, these parks could not stand that abuse. They began to be eroded. Um, the uh, wealthy people that lived around them resented the people coming in, the street people and that coming in, the musicians, the noise, the automobiles. So we thought, we can gain the support of this part of our population 
by saying we want these kind of activities to happen at the gas works, see? And, uh, and uh, also shooting down the Arboretum idea. We have these marvelous parks. What we really need is a more experimental park. Uh-oh. Excuse me. So I used to say, it's out of control. Thank you. So I, I would say that uh, no matter how you look at it, that, you know, that slide was reversing. No matter how you look at it, we have those parks. Maybe we're looking for something different. Even Seattle Center, uh, which is our most urban park, 40% paved, I think it is still a landscape experience, not an architectural experience. Oh, that's the one. No matter how you look at it, we have plenty of these parks. Seems to be a problem on the right machine. This was another uh, uh, another resource we had was the circulation. This railroad track was being taken up and would be a jogging and bicycling walking link to the University of Washington. So we would have a captive audience of 33,000 students just slightly over a mile from this park. Uh, the, the, some of the other sites we looked at were these two opposite shores under the freeway and uh, as you can see on the left we have designed small uh, outlook type parks, passive parks for both of those sites. So that was one case where we did expand our sphere of influence. Meanwhile back to the studies, the natural processes, uh, we mostly faked it. We didn't have exact data about when. Uh, and uh, we could walk down and see where the beach bo uh, bleach bottles floated up and things like that, you know. There are a lot of clues you can use. So we more or less faked it and uh, went through the motions. We did, uh, in every case, since we, I knew where I was headed, why the information here is all very supportive of the end uh, solution, you see. This is a, the condition, the plant had been boarded up and fenced off since 1956 until 1970. And that's typical, that's where the large bunker ships would come in. And I stood out there and I counted 27 openings of pipes into the lake, daylighting into the lake that uh, everything from raw sewage from the old administration buildings, there were 200 people that worked there at any given time, you know, around the clock raw sewage to sludge to chemicals, you name it, all being just dumped right into Lake Union. Incidentally, the water quality of the lake is, is vastly improved and it is rated Class A, which means that in the future you should be able to drink from this lake. That isn't true yet, but in the summer the water quality is quite high here. Vegetation. This was a real clue as to how poisoned the site was because in Seattle, with our, it's like a greenhouse really there, a very humid climate, and, uh, filtered sunlight. And, uh, in two years' time, any big <laughs> is covered with blackberry, scotch broom, and red alders all coming in the invasive plants. So this site had virtually been vacant for 15 years. The only thing growing there was a little fireweed had invaded. This is a, the plant I found in Germany and England that this is the first plant that starts crawling up the mine spoils. Can you hear me? Thank you. Fireweed, the most invasive plant. Well. The wealthy woman, she insisted that we hire soil, a soil consultant of her choice because she was going to pay his fee, but we had to follow his recommendations. So we showed Dr. Cole the borings, the logs of the borings, and he didn't believe this, couldn't believe it, because it was so erratic. Borings 50 feet apart would show a soil acidity from extremely acid to extremely alkaline within 50 feet. They would show uh, tar and soot and fire brick and sulfur and arsenic. We found a lot of arsenic that was there as a byproduct, you know. So he wouldn't believe the soil logs, and uh, so we 
we pulled open this hole with a back hole, and he went down to take samples like a archaeologist would or geologist and he was overcome by the exotic fumes there, the toxic fumes and we pulled him out and he had a headache for two weeks and he wrote a devastating report saying the site was totally poisoned it was worse than trying to landscape the moon and that we'd never get anything to grow on that site perfect we made sure that report was circulated around that was exactly what we'd hoped I mentioned the shoreline condition, which is always very important, and uh, this is a technique I've worked on uh, of not drawing on acres of paper, but why not just draw on the slide itself, you see? So I used mercurochrome in this primitive case, but now I've discovered a kind of pencil, a pen that works very well. But that's the margin, the red line, and remember that used to be tules and mud and very soft, and. Uh, Today, we have a 15-foot differential. Extruded from the operation itself, I called it a layer cake of industrial afterbirth. Industrial afterbirth, just spewed out, pushed out into the lake. Uh, even deep within the site, as you can see on the left here, you have no idea that there's water out there because of that bluff condition. So uh, you can see the mast of a sailboat go by perhaps or a float plane land, but uh, I decided that it would be a chance to do some fantastic earth grading, sculpturing and so on, to visually open the site up and connect it to the water. Tried to get into structures and processes because I thought there were clues there that we could use. Uh, this didn't turn out to be the case, though. This was a false uh, red herring that I, we followed for quite a while. And it is interesting to see the input on the right-hand side there, and then the uh, oil or coal, in the first case, was sent all the way to the northwest part of the site, and then back down to the central part, and then to the eastern part, and then back up to the north-central part. Typical engineering approach, you know, just... And it gave us eight and a half miles, over eight miles of pipe over 18 inches in diameter, and uh, over a thousand, about a thousand two hundred miles of pipe of all diameter. So what we see is really like an iceberg. And the plant, remember, in going from conversion to conversion, they would often just bury one whole pipe system. That was the cheapest thing to do, and lay in a new system and bring sand down from the hill and covered that up. So we had a real layer cake structurally as well as ecologically. The views, the chief asset of the site is its fantastic view of downtown Seattle. The view, in my opinion, this is the best view of Seattle, better than uh, from the tops of the hills because everything is doubled, reflected in the water. I think that's quite a beautiful drawing there. Very graphic, very simplistic. Uh, no computer graphics. We did a very simple thing about the uh, visual basin, we called it, and it's so obvious I won't go into it, but views of and from. This is that unpretentious neighborhood that grew up to the north, and that's up or downwind of the plant, which would be down at the bottom of this hill here. And uh, the houses are very... Uh, almost low-class houses. They were mainly for the workers in the gas plant, and uh, they faced east and west. They're on a south-facing slope with a reflected view of the city and the lake. This is the highest and best real estate in the city when you think about it. And the really wealthy uh, tracks are, uh, don't have near the advantages, and they're all located out. This is in canoe distance from downtown, or bicycle distance from downtown Seattle. But I was very concerned about this neighborhood. And this takes us into citizen input and all. I have very peculiar ideas about citizens' input. I, I think that I have spent most of my waking hours concerned with aesthetics, landscape architecture, and so on. And why, uh, you know, isn't it too much to expect a layperson to come in and give, give me really good advice? It uh, would seem to degrade my education. So I'm very chary of citizens' input, and I, I will solicit it 
but I want to propose first. I don't want first ideas from people. I will propose first and they can dispose. So that's how I approach this with a, a period of, of uh, education and expanding the levels of consciousness. I pointed out to these, the, the planning, see this, this, our communities are highly organized, structured in Seattle, the community councils. This community had a planning subcommittee. So I worked with the chairman of that subcommittee. He was an ex-student of mine. Then he took my ideas to his committee. And then the committee took the ideas to the whole council. And that's the way we tried to work, one-on-one, -on -one, face to face, gradually expanding. Mayor. Yes, sir. Mayor. Oh yeah, the mayor the mayor was born on this street. It's a it's a house right under that tree. So that's where he was born and raised. And uh, here was a thing that happened. He was interviewed on television. It was about uh, what do you consider the worst eyesores and what are you going to do to clean them up? And he said, the gas works park is undoubtedly the worst eyesore in the city. And when I am uh, mayor, I'm going to be the first man in with a cutting torch and cut that place down. Well, it turned out that the interviewer was a friend of mine, and he, that didn't make the evening news. He just, uh, he, he gave me a private showing of that tape. But, uh, so, anyhow, in park design, see, here's a, here's a problem. The immediate neighborhood and their immediate needs, they are going to exert an inordinate influence on the future of that park. That is a very difficult thing to circumvent or to uh, use to your advantage. Okay, views of, this is from the navigation channel and 104,000 boats a year pass this point. They're clocked because they go through the government locks, you see. So this is what most people's attitude, the wealthy people, the influential decision makers, this is what they thought of the site. Around the lake, there's still many houseboats and that's a view that they have. It was good. Very early, we got the uh, uh, backing, uh, approaching this way, uh, this concept from the Floating Homes Association. And that's the way we did. We had many, many uh, hearings and showings, and that's the big tower that I tried to save. And when I signed my contract, uh, we had 11 days to save that tower. And already, I, I didn't have a good, good approach or concept, so I made a last-ditch effort to save that large holding tank, the skeleton, the frame. I almost had these wealthy women talked into buying that from the contractor, and then we would own it, and we would decide whether we wanted to tear it down. And the thing was that we used this strategy that you can always tear something down, but you can't replace it. So let's go easy, step at a step, step by step. There was this problem. Uh, this was like the mayor saying, the worst eyesore in the city, it just sticks up there on the north end of the lake. Does it really? I took this trick photograph, you know? Pictures don't lie, but... I took the picture, it's a double exposure, it's looking due south from a point midway down the lake, and there's the Space Needle, Seattle Center, and Grandma's Cookies and the Gas Works right there in the middle is, uh, that's the silhouette. And up on 45th Street on the hill, I can envision buildings like this coming in there, blocking the skyline. It's happening today, just a few years later. So is that really so visually oppressive? I would say it's a, it's a weak image, it needs strength, and to prove that I would show uh, San Marco. The night show, the light show, I mean, every night for free. Great storm watching place, romance, spacing out, whatever. It's a fantastic site. It's a noisy site. Well, then I got onto this gimmick that, uh, you know, maybe since America has no ruins, unless you think of Palos, Palos Verde or uh, Grand Canyon or something, we have no man-made ruins to speak of. It used to be that to be a well-educated gentleman, 
you would have made the grand tour, right? You would have gone through Asia Minor and maybe into India and certainly uh, Egypt and Greece and all to look at the ruins. I believe there's something inherent in all humankind that there is a fascination of decay. There is a searching for past, uh, past recollections of, of uh, man-made things. And so I began to look at these towers in quite a different way and to think that here is an artifact, a living uh, a skeleton of honoring man's uh, monumental inhumanity or de degradation of his environment. Uh, we teach our children about the Industrial Revolution and we take them to a Coca-Cola bottling plant. I mean, what is this? So how are they to know? Well, let's save some of these remnants. And I did research and I found this was the last existing, the last of a vanished species. There are no oxygen gas generating towers left in the world. At one time I used this to my advantage because when the adversaries, the con confrontation got very heavy, I worked out the farms and I went to the federales and they were ready to put this on the historic engineering record. And then the city found out about this and they said, no, heck, don't do that. And let's not get the federales involved. And, um, but it, it bought me time. I used, had to use many strategies like this. Oops. I, uh, when the park was to be named in honor of Myrtle Edwards, this councilwoman who began, the, who had the idea of buying the site, and, uh, but her surviving family, she died in an automobile accident, and her surviving family said, we don't want to have anything to do with those towers. You know, she wanted roses and reflecting balls. I, I'm not sure. She was a pretty adventurous and gutsy old woman, and I think I could have sold her on these ideas. I really do. But her family, uh, her engineering husband, engineer husband, he wanted no part of it. But I used to say in the early days that that outboard oxygen generating tower would be a fitting monument to Myrtle Edwards, who was an ironclad old gal. And her husband was always in her shadow, and then they had four children, and who would split up a family, you know? Now, this is what I call the Khrushchev technique, it's for some of you older citizens here. And this is a technique of always going for more than you can get, more than you hope to get. Go for a larger site, a larger budget. Uh, um, so I was going for broke because I can always cut back. If the pressure gets bad, I can say, here, I'll give you a pawn. You can have this tower, take it down. And never in my wildest imagination did I think that I would save all that I did save, though. In fact, there are a couple of things left there that I could, I could give up. <clears throat> well, I'm out of, out of phase now. Let's see what happens. Okay, I think that's it. Let's try advancing. Yeah, that's it. Here's another thing I had going for me was that uh, the University of Washington Department of Architecture and Planning, since 19, about 1910, groups of students had gone to this site, been taken there uh, around the perimeter, and then after the site was closed up, where they would get permission to enter the site, and they would go down there on the Beaux-Arts week and make paintings and sketches and etchings and all, which would be sold at an auction. And uh, these paintings, uh, one of these is in the uh, boardroom of the Seattle First National Bank. Another one is in the boardroom of the Washington Natural Gas Company and all. So I had two generations of architects in Seattle who had sentimental uh, feelings, nostalgic feelings about the old works. The photographers had discovered it and uh, today it's used a great deal in fashion photography, uh, selling shiny automobiles. You, you can see how it would work as a perfect foil. And so I found paintings without painters. I found Kandinsky, uh, de Kooning, de Stelt, Gestalt. I, everybody is there.
and even this kind of uh, painting and sculpture, beauty of the rust. This brings up a point uh, let, I might forget later. They would, people would ask me, what are you going to do with those dark and ugly towers? And uh, I'd say, well, I'm thinking about that. And then they'd come on stronger, you know, well, what are you going to do? And I said, well, we're going to take fire hoses up there and we're going to flush the rust out of the deep crevices, the soot, where it will cause structural damage. That would usually satisfy them. But they might say, well, what are, you going, are you going to paint them colors, bright colors? And I'd say, well, right now our feeling is that we're going to antique them. They'd say, oh, fine, great, you know, and walk off. We have a rather famous painter who is in this kind, into this kind of thing. So I promised Klaus that I will melt the snow and uh, clean the pipes, and he can do this in three-dimensional, 3D. And newspapers uh, are still today my enemies, the two leading newspapers. This, uh, this is bad that I could have not been able to convert them yet. But I did cause one newspaper to stop writing the, the terrible editorials. I took them down and I told these reporters, I want you to stand here and listen to the conversation of these pipes. Think about that. You know, they've been there talking together for 15 years. And then there's the Rube Goldberg in us all. Farm machinery, a Yankee ingenuity, right? We're all involved in that. So I could appeal to that segment of our population. That is, happens to be in the Museum of Modern Art, I believe it was. It's a memorial to Rube Goldberg. But look ahead, think of Picasso. And he dropped this iron lady in the loop there at Chicago, and he laughed all the way back to France with $250,000. <laughs> And Tingley and Zurich, uh, the assemblage type of thing. So scale is quite similar to much of our equipment. Mexico City, they're into it. This is a whole wave of contemporary uh, sculpture. Uh, maybe there is this nostalgic. Maybe the sculptors are, are already missing, miss the passing of the uh, in Industrial Revolution and all. Actually, I think that the unpretentious engineered thing, like the Burlington Northern Signal on the right, is a much better piece of sculpture than the self-conscious thing on the left. So anyhow, I did a balance sheet and I figured that the going rate, we had about three million dollars worth of sculpture down there. Just some more uh, detailed shots. The, just an incredible wealth, complexity, light working over it, shadow, sounds, wind blowing through. And uh, many of us uh, went through this stage of uh, playing on the old, the older ones on French 75s in the city hall uh, the court and uh, playing on equipment, old World War planes and So I began to think, hey, the play styles are changing. If children get something, a uh, wheeze out of climbing around on such a contrivance as that, maybe adults would get a big thing out of climbing on these. This was a very mysterious woman, you know, the lady of the lake and all. This was the lady of the works. And she haunted the place. I was continuously running into her. Is that fertile? <laughs> no, that was infertile. There's one, uh, two of my friends up on top to give you an idea of the scale. It's about 68 feet tall, the, the big mother tower, I call it, Myrtle Edwards Tower. And it's 16 feet in diameter, two feet of fire brick inside, and a half inch plate steel. And the man on top waving, he happened to be a promoter, a media type person who put together Sky River 2, which was our uh, second uh, rock festival or sort of comparable to uh, Wood, uh, what's the name of the one? Good stuff, right. And uh, so this uh, woman uh, writer, a critic, art critic, aesthetics, aesthetician, she wrote in the leading paper how horrible and ugly and what junk that was out there at the gas works. And she had heard that some weirdos were trying to save it and uh, we must destroy it, murder it, get rid of it. 
but she thought the locomotive in the local zoo was just super, just beautiful and all. I don't see the difference, really. They're both kettles and both uh, cookers. That's what they are, pressure cookers. All right, you always look for precedent, don't you? That's a trident, especially in the legal profession. And so I looked for precedent. I got a, a scholarship and I went to Europe on sabbatical. I thought, sure, I'd find some bombed out plants or something. I found interesting industri open air industrial museums in England. I found, uh, well, Coventry, you know about Coventry. You know about Hiroshima, the uh, old mu skeleton on the Museum of Industry in Hiroshima, Japan. I found this in uh, Switzerland, in uh, Bern, where they did take some gas holding tanks and converted them into uh, roller skating rinks and clubhouses and things. In Stoke-on-Trent, I found this fantastic colliery machinery. I talked to the town architect, and he's waging a losing battle there. The people say, it is ugly, it reminds us of our terrible past, uh, it is dangerous, There's, it's an um, n attractive nuisance, methane gas is there, it costs too much to maintain it, how do we paint it? Uh, just the same, same arguments that I knew I would have to face at GasWorks. Well, I was getting some encouragement from the park superintendent. I had the luck of having a young manager, young man as a manager of this project, representing the park department. He wasn't a swinger quite, but he, could, he took ideas quite well. And he took them to his boss, and his boss was a man of military background who had been in charge of the recreation program, athletic program for the occupation forces in Germany. So I thought, oh man, a typical jock, you know, how am I going to sell these ideas to this man? Well, he, he began to listen to us and uh, he humored us. Well, that's crazy, it won't work. The park board will shoot you down, but go ahead, study it a little further. No. So I made this very graphic uh, abstraction at one point, showing what I intended to save. And uh, you will, if you squint your eyes on that, you will see there's a little bit of visual swindle here, right? The one, one shot I wanted to show all of that was there as intensely as I could, so I zoomed in and put as much black in that film, as I, in that shot as I can. The other one I pulled back some, they're, they look much smaller in scale to the side and all. So it's a visual swindle. I use them all the time, but you do have to be careful because if you overdo it, a client will catch on and then you're really in trouble, you see. So this, this was my vision. I thought we'll create this plaza with commerce and, and happiness, exuberance, buoyancy, raucousness, Whatever. We'll get the beautiful contestants strolling down there, and we'll get a foreground of 5,000 winged rats, and who has to pay to go to Venice? Well, this was a problem with the mayor, though, right? The brain damaged mayor. Well, I began to uh, show slides like I've just shown you began to put this show together and build it up. And then 71 was my first presentation uh, to the uh, Park Department staff. The maintenance mind, you all know it, I'm sure, if you design parks. It is awful, the maintenance mind. So I didn't do too well, so I was worried. And I called in then next the Seattle Design Commission, which is a very unique body of kind of aesthetic, aesthetic or ombudsman, uh, ombudsman of aesthetics, aesthetics. They separate the designer from the politician. There's a slight buffer. It's beautiful. Every city, state should have a design commission. I had them in my pocket, so the red dot indicates unanimous approval of this approach, this concept. And so I went down through this list. This is, what, nine or ten months of showing it. I'm very carefully staging, very careful as to who saw it, when, and in what, what order. Timing, I can't stress this too much. In any idea you have promotion of it, timing is a very crucial element. Control it if you can. You will notice that uh, it was way down in October that I finally showed that revealed this approach to the 
Society of Landscape Architects because I was frankly worried about them. I wanted all of these other approvals first. Uh, the Arboretum scheme has lost out, but the Arboretum people joined with the yacht, yachting people and they decided they would do an alternate scheme, take over the site for a kind of a Seattle Mystic Connecticut scheme. Can you believe that they proposed tearing down everything there and building a fake lighthouse, you know, right in the city? But this was a very formidable uh, coalition of forces. How do, you de how do I deal with that one? There were uh, constantly, uh, in the, this was in the newspapers and other schemes and alternative schemes. I'll tell you that even at even after the master plan had been accepted by the park board and staff and design commission, everybody more than the city council and the mayor had approved this plan, this approach. Even at that time, the uh, mayor sent the park superintendent to my office and he sat down and he said, Hag, the mayor says that you have to do an alternate scheme. I was just dumbstruck. I said, oh, I'm not going to do an alternate scheme. Well, he says, you're being ordered to do an alternate scheme. I don't believe, I believe in doing alternate schemes. Hell, any designer goes through alternate after alternate, right? But I do not believe in showing alternates to a client. You show the client your best scheme. That's it. And if he brings up other conditions that, uh, so why don't you try it this way and so on. Then you can bring out, say, look, I had that idea, I carried it this far, and this is why it's bad, and that's why I filed it away, and I don't want to show it to you. This is the best scheme. That I will do. But I was really nonplussed by this. I didn't know what to do. I said, I'm just not going to do an alternate scheme. He said, well, what will you do? I said, well, you will hire another consultant, and I will fight you. By this time, I had a lot of public support and a lot of support in official agencies. And all. I said, I will fight you in the streets at the university. And I almost got it polarized into an adversary position. Avoid that. Never get into a totally adversary position. Buy some time. That's what I did. I said, give me a couple of weeks to think about it. And I had created uh, some drawings, horrible drawings by graphic artist, uh, kind of, um, uh, what's this stuff, acrylic drawing, paintings, you know, of what it would look like. He took those to the mayor. The mayor said, oh, is that the way it's going to be? Well, let's let him go ahead for a while longer, you know. But actually, I did develop an alternate scheme a few, uh, idea a few days later, and that was that if they came back and said, You've got to do a serious alternate scheme. I was going to move the whole mound over, cover the, bury the towers, then 15 year, 50 years some kid would be digging there, you know, hey dad, what's this? God, he'd start digging, the industrial archaeologists would come in all, from all over the world and say, my God, a preserved oxygen gas generating system. Well, another strategy is to get people committed Try this on your clients. Get them spending some money. You know, first you want a retainer, right? So you know they're serious. And then you get them spending some money on something. Right off. Quick projects in it. So I said, hey, uh, we've got to start pruning this site. Selective pruning. And uh, did, did I forget? John, did I tell about the gas company and their attorneys and uh, taking everything down to site, down to grade? No? This was one of the conditions of transfer of this property to the city, which would take place now in 1973. You know, everything you've seen is up in 1971 yet. The thing was that everything had to be, every structure had to be removed. I told you that. But I read that clause very carefully, and it said, to grade. And I thought, to grade, what does that mean? You know, is that existing grade? Is that, wait a minute, maybe that's down to the level of the old bog. God, think of that, tons of concrete buried there. Does that mean the gas company's gonna have to blast all that out at their expense? So I went to their attorneys and I said, give me a readout on this. How do you interpret this? They weren't sure. 
this is the kind of thing that Philadelphia lawyers love, you know. And so they said, they got worried. So I said, why don't you back my preservation plan? And they backed this plan because, and I made the figures work too. I showed that they could save $80,000 by following the preserved structures plan. Then I tried to get, and this actually worked out, and I tried to get them then to give the park department 80000 their $80,000 saving for, for development. That didn't quite work. But, see, let's get some action. So, okay, Hag, maybe this plan will succeed. What do you want to take out? So I approached it like a sculptor with a big block of stone or like you would approach an, an old apple tree that hadn't been maintained. You go in there and you cut out the worst. You climb down, you study it, and you walk around. This plant, as you saw, was so complex, I just couldn't imagine it with certain elements pulled out in that. I knew where the, the most dangerous, decrepit, ugliest view blocking and so on. So we made three different demolition cuts. And we did it just this way. There were no drawings, no way to do it that way. I just went through there with a spray can, and R was removed, and S was saved. It was that simple. Now, some wag came in and pornographed my uh, S, but uh, that happens, you know. And there's a whole race of men whose objective is to tear down, just demolish. Go to the Pentagon if you don't believe me. And this man on the left here, you think that's out of focus? Well, you're wrong, because that's the way he appeared. I mean, the world appeared to him. He had a fifth in the morning and a fifth in the afternoon. <laughs> that was nighty. And here we go with the first phase. You can see some of it. It looked like an atomic war had been fought there. A actually, we saved that two buildings there. This we saved. This is the old trestle that we took down the wooden part of this trestle, but the trains used to back up in there with coal for the great boilers and compressors. And here are the machines. Often it took two or three machines. Uh, we couldn't blast on this site. At one time we almost, uh, we thought about and almost set up a plant to convert concrete back to gravel again. And uh, actually the economics worked for us here. It costs more to remove concrete and haul it to special approved dumps than it does to pour new concrete. But uh, watch out, because I think within 10 years time this is going to change. We will have the technology to cut huge foundations into reusable, recyclable, recyclable concrete. That's coming very soon. Uh, I mentioned the eight miles, eight, more than eight miles of pipe this size. All of this pipe was supposed to, by law, have been evacuated, and it wasn't. All the gas company did was they just sealed up the ends out at the edge of the lake. So we had surprise after surprise. Those two buildings, I'll back it up, I'll see if I can back it. Those two buildings we saved there, the two buildings, those are actually wooden framed buildings. The sheet metal is all shot, but the, the wood structure was actually preserved because soot with water, make rainwater makes sulfuric acid, and that preserves wood but attacks metal. So we decided to save those and recycle those buildings. Now, this became the cover of the report, which I finally actually did. And here at this time, it was called Myrtle Edwards Park. And they rejected that, and uh, now she does have a rose garden down on the waterfront, which gets swept over with salt water, and her memorial park isn't doing too well. And they decided to call it Gasworks Park, which is so good, because that's what everybody would have called it anyway. That's a quick drawing we made for the uh, environmental impact statement, negative impact. Shorelines management. We had the, so we had many overlay, overlaying jurisdictions, the Army Corps of Engineers. Yes. Did you want something? John? Oh, yeah, on a, on a warm day, and this still happens. That's it on the right. Here's how we overcame the historic ships, people. We said, you're right, this is a perfect place. You'll need shore support. So we'll give you part of these uh, 
activities in these buildings that we're saving. The San Mateo will be a great restaurant and a floating museum. And uh, we want you. We need you and you need us. So that took them out of the picture. And uh, what else? Well, I'll point out a few things since you are landscape architects and all. Uh, first, we keep the cars back out of the site, right? This is still an active railroad track. One donkey engine and a flat car go through here to serve one mill once a week. So it's no problem. So the parking is all in here. Many entries. We don't want to gate it and all, so you can enter the site just at any point all along. However, there is kind of a ceremonial formal entrance right here from the railroad, well, railroad trestles. Remember those? Uh, these are the two buildings we wanted to save. This will be the picnic shed, and we need covered picnic sheds in Seattle. And this was the most quiet and passive part of the site. It's, it's hidden back in here and uh, catches the, the morning sun uh, and the afternoon sun really well when you need it the most there. And this is the children's play barn. And we decided to have a garden of machines there. And uh, we would expand this into this southern wind, sun shaded or uh, sun pocket and wind shaded area. It's a pit there. The historic ships all clustering in here. The great more earth sculpture cutting down to water level. We thought we could maintain a natural beach here due to the wind accretion uh, and so on, wind direction. The great morning bowl and the noon bowl, and yet these can work together. If the music barge anchors out here, then we can have 15, 20, 30,000 people in there for a really big event. The prow, we saved this. This is the most sacred tower, and it's uh, the husband and the children. And this is a proposed uh, visual arts, uh, performing arts center. Again, this is a wolf trap arrangement. It could work in reverse, you see. The prow and getting down to the water's edge. This was a subterfuge here, this moat. We never intended to moat those towers, but there was so much anxiety about preserving them and safety and everything that we said we will moat those until uh, and keep them for their visual, historic, their scale-giving qualities, and uh, we will keep most people away from them by the old system of a moat. So that was a subterfuge. That was a promise that we never intended to keep, actually. This is the and all the commercial and villages, water around. And then this was going to be the Great Mound. Here it is shown here as the Great Mound, where we take all of the junk soil, the really polluted soil that we get out of here, and we open up that uh, soil that you saw there, the white Vashon uh, till, and we bury that. That's a little time bomb we'll leave for the future generations to discover our own little chemical dump there. I don't know what happened, but uh, this does have some scotch broom on. This is one of the state waterways that flank the site. And uh, the state would allow us to encroach into this area. And so that would be up the way up there in the upper right-hand corner on the right screen. Now that's the picnic bowl. OK, activities. Now, we want to include everybody, and we really want to get the middle-class Americans, right? So what's more middle-class Midwestern American than a potato sack race? You name it, if you know it. And then we wanted earth play and all of those great uh, primordial kind of experiences. So you can't uh, get too wild with that, but that's an innocent scene there, isn't it? The children playing around at the edge of the water. And we have resident geese there, and we hope to keep those. And the Army Corps of Engineers uh, tows out the big deadheads, the logs that come drifting down and burns them. So we want them to stop that and to tow some in and leave them on the site. And uh, our boy and his dog. Now, that, that's, that's heartwarming, isn't it, to a politician to see such a simple, innocent, beautiful scene. Uh, 
was commercial, lots of commercial boat rentals, and uh, maybe the Mayflower replica would sail out of Barcelona and pay us a visit. And the training ships from Denmark and Germany and Japan could sail in. We actually had these ships at the site, the uh, light ship relief tugboat Annie Foss, which was the heroine in the uh, tugboat Annie series, the Arthur Foss. And we had the San Mateo, the big boat, the ferry. Now, all of these boats were brought away, uh, brought, uh, taken away by private entrepreneurs to another site. And now they're all being brought back, but to the south end of Lake Washington. So the ideas about the water taxi and all will, will come into being now. It's just a perfect relationship, actually. Well, this is the concourse. This is the way it was. This is what we're proposing. Actually, the people in Wallingford, they thought there was too much commercial. Each one of those little, is a kit of parts, each one of those little uh, squares, rectangles, are some kind of a shop we were promoting. So they didn't like that. They said, we don't want all that commercial down there, although they're separated by two full blocks of commercial and manufacturing zoning. So uh, in later proposals, I just stamped more trees over those buildings. So that, uh, and I told them also, I said, well, look, what, what, I'll do what you want. Would you rather have Colonel Sanders and his bucket of fat outside the gate, or would you rather have controlled food inside the gate, you know? They came around. So these shots or pictures, I'm just trying to express what I think I can do with the landscape. I am not quite sure yet. I've got this junk soil to work with. That was Paley Park, for those who know. I think eating is a high form of recreation, so I intended to have floating restaurants to hand the uh, um, uh, Danish hot dog stands on wheels, hand food, street food, fine five-course meals. And I showed this slide because that was Mrs. Myrtle Edwards, and she had been on an urban design study tour, and this was a five-course dinner that we had in Amsterdam, you see. And I thought that would appeal to her husband, but uh, he didn't, he missed the point. The Washington apples, of course, what better place to promote those. Lighting is landscape quality, best place in the city to fly a kite, and buy your girl some flowers. Theater from the wildest gorilla type theater to the most sophisticated Japanese no drama. The Maharinas would come in from India with their movie cameras. The question arises, what do you do with the towers? Well, I said, uh, well, I think the Western mind really has a problem of saving something just because it is, because it exists. So you do have to come up with these ideas. And I, I, that Zen saying I gave to you this afternoon about um, a thing that is not used has something negative in its beauty. So I began to think, well, how could we use these? Anyhow, subterfuges to save them is the main thing. We can always figure out how to use them. That was Osaka. This one is slated now, today, to become a camera obscura, modeled after Patrick Getty's camera obscura in Glasgow. And um, I have some wealthy clientele who I think are going to donate this camera obscura as a tax write-off, see? And maybe we'll get Nikon or Kodak or somebody to come in with the lenses. What's that? John? Oh, excuse me. Oh, okay. Well, so we came up with a list of at least 30 things that are mentioned in their report, from walk-in cloud chambers, uh, many uh, vertical Guggenheim-type museums, interpretive towers. Uh, we need one just to hold lake water for putting out fires and irrigation. We can cut holes in them and plant Lombardi poplars in the side, just as you plant strawberries in a in a in a barrel, you know, tremendous urns, I call them. I'm working on a uh, pool table that is circular with one hole on a raised mound in the middle. And, uh, you know, games uninvented, metaphysical happenings, all kinds of things we can have. I'll invite you out and play a game of pool after I get onto it myself. 
Lighting, nothing had been done. for Since 1956, there was no lights on that 20-acre site, so every, naturally everybody thought it was a desperate, dangerous, Stygian uh, moat in the eye of Seattle. It was, and uh, so all kinds of things can be done here with the lighting quality. Internally, externally, very simple, quick sketches of, for, of a smaller one that we would use for children. So I teach, I believe in teaching through demonstration. So like my office was a demonstration of what could be done. And uh, we keep moving into larger and larger scale with these. The restaurants can spring out from the bases of them. All kinds of theater, a cinema, the cinema in the 360 degrees. Here's another promise that I've changed my mind on now. But it, it worked, you see. The uh, thing was that if you want something in Seattle, you find it in Vancouver or San Francisco. And then you tell the city fathers, but they have it in, in San Francisco. Oh, well, then we've got to have one too, right? So this is a boss you find in San Francisco, and I used that gimmick to uh, say that I wanted to use vegetation very close to the towers, that each would gain from that relationship man and nature. The Germans know how to do it. Maybe a little too much umpa, but lots of beer is flowing freely. And now we have an ordinance in Seattle where you can have beer and wine under controlled, somewhat controlled conditions in the park system. I tell you, recreation is breaking through. This is what I was proposing, you see. And this, this has been built, but not quite this way, or actually better than this, I think. And this was very prognosticative because I said we should have the local Indian war canoe races restaged right in Seattle. And we could have salmon baked on the beach and uh, people could be taken on dugout rides. We could have longhouses and all. And uh, <clears throat> last week, <clears throat> last Friday, I had a meeting with the superintendent of parks, a new man, and uh, with the United Tribes. And that is exactly what we're proposing. Longhouses, Indian war canoe races, salmon bakes on the beach. I was even after the Italian population. See, I said, all of your relatives can come over from Venice and, and uh, take us for gondolier rides. Mafia's put them out of business, and so has Aaron Rood, so they're looking for work. They'll come. <laughs> and then uh, the water nymphs will come down from the hill and the old men come down and a whole kind of social ecology is set up and i i go for symbolism but i go for the real thing even more water edge condition that's vancouver incidentally see anything from vancouver san francisco i said we would celebrate water in every form and way from the most natural to the most Italian, mechanical, mechanized. We would establish our own uh, trout system, our trout sp uh, salmon spawning, and this is part of the Indian proposal, to establish a run of salmon from Gasworks Park site, just south, the uh, State Waterway 19. That brings in uh, boys and girls for fishing and tackle sales, and this kind of grading is what I had in mind, massive grading. And uh, this was at Sky River 2, on, held on the Mima Mounds, and that gave me ideas about earth sculpture, and that's what I was proposing. So much to do, lots of benches. Our students would just flake out there. We made the cover of rolling uh, uh, landscape architecture, and uh, now we're going full bore. We have approvals, unanimous approvals. Saddle Design Commission, the Park Board, the AIP, Floating Homes, Allied Arts. We're just rolling along. Still not approved, though. So we could put more money into the site. We figure the more money we can get in there, the sooner, the safer we are. Because now a man is running for, for mayor getting ready to run from there, and his platform is he's going to sell the site to the promoter, to the developers. They'll build tower apartments there. 
you'll take his $20 million profit and buy other sites in less expensive areas or use that in a fund to maintain the other parks that we have. This is coming up, see? That kind of a threat. So we say, let's put more money into this plan. We mark everything again. We go in deeper and deeper into the site. Beautiful machinery. The city, the wealthy woman, you remember the woman that made us have the soils consultant? She said, stop all work in that. Uh, she's getting a court injunction and so on and so on. We've got to get some more soil experts in. These two men come up from uh, Glendale, California. And they say, sure, we can clear this up. We will drive pipes under the soil and we will force live steam through the site and cook it out for you. Just cost you $800,000, but we can do it. So I got an old man, uh, an old man, and his fee was a fifth of Jim Bean. Actually, he didn't want anything, but I gave him a fifth of Jim Bean. Walked him around there, he kicked around there, he smelled the soil and all. He says, Hag, we can grow anything you want to grow here. Okay, I said, how do we do that? And I contacted the shell people who have been developing strains of bacteria that thrive on hydro hydrocarbon molecules. So I said, I know, we have to get some of the secret spores in here, right? Said, no, no, I said, anything they have will be in this site. It's been vacated for 15, 20 years, and uh, 15 about, and it's here, it's here already. All we have to do is get oxygen to it, get sunlight to it, and let the rain warm it, uh, filter through it and all. We have to plow it up. At the same time, we have to bring in humus. We'll start a giant composting. We'll get all the sawdust that's now hauled from the mills up to the Mukilteo or uh, estuary, an immoral thing in itself, We'll get all of that for free. We'll get the leaves from the trees and the weeds from the high freeway. And we'll get the sweepings out of the zoo cages. We can't tell the people about this, though. But imagine what kind of exotic biotica we had in the sweepings from the animal cages. And he told me to make test plots. And in my greenhouse, I began right away. And then in the field itself, and here's my results. We found that in these chemical poisoning situations, we go to one plant, we went to cement factory plant. We got their fly ash, which is very alkali. We came down and we mixed that in with our cinders. And so you can take and, and recombine many of these poisons and neutralize them, so get them neutralized. So this was the biological approach that we used, and this result of two test plots on the site. We also developed many techniques for cleaning the machinery. And this little water gun here, which a man can hold like a wand, it's portable. It produces 20,000 pounds of pressure per square inch. It can cut through concrete or brick, wood, just splinters, and it can take metal right down to bright metal, all the grease and soot. The mayor is still holding out. I sweep out the back guano from this building, uh, not that, pigeon guano, and walk him through there right by this machine that we in my office cleaned up and painted as an exhibition. He did not even see that machine. I had to turn him around and say, hey, look at that. You know. But later, I saw him by himself fondling these machines. Two years later, I found out that as a small boy, when he'd get mad at his parents or something, he would break in, sneak down there, and have adventures with these machines. So I got to him finally. <laughs> this man came from Japan to see how we're mixing up sawdust and uh, sewage, human sewage, primary digester. So everybody in Seattle contributed their bit to the success <laughs> of this plan. This caused a problem. We had 20 acres of tomatoes that first summer, see? And the newspapers, that's a human pile there in the middle, in case you wanted. We uh, had uh, the newspaper interviewed the workers, and this man said, I've had an extreme, aggravated case of diarrhea since I've been eating these tomatoes. I love them, but I'm sick. 
This went into their paper. The Metro engineers were really excited, you know, bad PR. Here's the first time they've used this in public lands, this way, re recycling waste. So they ran these tomatoes through the spectrograph. There was a high concentration of heavy metals. But one of their young chemists went over to the Safeway and got a four pack, you know, out of San Joaquin Valley. Same test, nearly double the level of heavy metals. The whole issue was dropped. This model I made very rapidly from that black and white model, and it's quite crude. I just cut up a plan, pasted it over it, and put some pencils on there and antique them with gold for the towers. And it's a real cheap job, but you know they photograph fairly well. Finally, uh, the newspapers keep jumping on us, and it be, it's escapes from the park department. It becomes a citywide political issue. And I have to present to about 2,000 people the full city council and the mayor in this great hall. And this was a, pretty much the show I gave them. And uh, there was quite a heated debate with this wealthy woman grabbing the microphone and saying, this is all a visual swindle. You can't do any of this. And besides, you're getting a fee of a million dollars. You know, I said, I wish, lady. You know, I'm getting a, I'd be lucky to get a hundred thousand dollar fee out of this project. Anyhow, there we go. And finally, they approved, they approved it unanimously. So now we begin construction. That's the cut and fill earth calculation plan showing the great mound. I think it's a work of art in itself. And happy people putting on. Uh, I, I think I told you today, some of you, about this as well. I wanted the cheap corrugated fiberglass. This was what I got, though. Well, there's no point. We decided to work up near the entrance first, of course, and, uh, and as a demonstration, well, it took two years to persuade the park department to break their rule about hydro seeding. They say you, there's a policy you can't hydro seed or side unless you have an irrigation system installed first. It took two years to break through that stupid kind of a ruling. We didn't want to put all the money into irrigation. Besides, I like it. The site turns brown. People burn part of it every year. It, it's, that's nature. That's a changing, changing attitude. The kids get cardboard and slide down the dry grass, you know. That's an experiment that didn't work, John. I'm, I'm sorry about that, but uh, we tried. There's my people, Doug Tuma from Louisiana State. And I, have, I always had the best people around me. That's my success, really. There's Doug and Mike was the architect. And that tree is one of my children, too. I grew that Zelkova from seed. It's uh, nearly 10 inch in caliper. And I root pruned it the year before and moved it down there in a great a lumber truck with a boom on it and planted it, and it's flourishing there. That's a test tree. I thought we'd have to use weed trees, willows and poplars as a test. But I decided, hell, we'll go, go for the best. So we got Zalcova there, got Purple Beach around, got fruit trees in too, snuck those in past the park department. This called a malus species, see? And then the contractor says, what do you mean by this malus species? Well, we need Jonathan, we... <laughs> grab and stain, you know, that's what we mean. So the birds mate, as they've always done, without benefit of clergy, but my students, they have clergy there, and they get united. Sometimes we let vehicles in. This dance troupe is coming in. This is all part of a movie that was made about the park. And here's some of the machinery. Now, the paint, the color is too bright, in many cases, I think, and uh, so on, but... It's done for the other designers, you know. The children wouldn't give a damn about it, but uh, we do those things. There's the great mound and some of the uses that it's put to. It has a crater in the top so you can get in there and get out of the winds and out of some of the noise and still see the lights come up and fly kites. And here are the new biles are getting ready for the dances. And and the macho guys way up in the structures, you know. It is frightening to be there in a space like this, just alive. It's like Monkey Island. And yet, there's not been a serious accident there yet. It's incredible. It must be uh, 200,000 play hours or something like that. 
an intensive play without an accident. That's the, the city uh, park engineer, this man. He was big help all the way along. Only his problem was he wanted to see this compressor fired up again, you see. <laughs> and, you know, he might, he might be right. If the energy thing keeps on, why well, we might be the first to convert a park back into a gas generating plant again. You can always take it down, but you can't put it back. Befores and after. Those wheels are, those uh, governors, those wheels are uh, 10 feet in diameter. Not governors. Spaced out people. Having that, oh, that woman. I must tell you about this, uh, mister. Let's see. There, that woman, I'm going to do an article on her. She's of Swedish descent and lives up in one of those funny little houses. And she, the park is like an extension of herself. She spends three hours every morning there picking up around the park. She plants flowers and squash and corn, which I think is even better. And she is the, the old woman of the park. And she uh, is like Jane Addams, you know. She watches what goes on there. She reports to me every month or so. We have a marvelous relationship. And here's one of the things that they have every Sunday afternoon <clears throat> at Gasworks, musical rallies and all. Now this is the next phase of construction, the children's play area, an extension. There's the children's own space needle, one that they can manipulate and handle and all, you see? You would, I, I could tell you about the fights I've had with the zoning codes and all of that. It's just an incredible what you have to put up with today. It, it's in unbelievable. Like the master plan shows a path around the water's edge, right? Any designer knows that people want to get to the water's edge. That's natural, instinctual. Okay, in this phase of construction, I began to improve those paths. They said, you must have a handrail wherever that path goes. I said, what the hell? Are you going to uh, fence in the whole lake? Are we going to fence in the Pacific Ocean? I mean, what's happening? So they insisted on it. So I said, screw you. I won't show any paths there. I'll just let the people go down there. And that's OK, you see, as long as you don't show the path. <laughs> And this, the arguments we had about who should climb up there and know how high the lowest rung should be, you see. And the next one I do, I'm going to have graduated rungs from high up to begin with so real little children can't get on. And then they will be quite spaced far apart and then get progressively closer in that. You can do those kinds of things. But, oh, God, that's part of growing up, to have adventure. You're going to stifle that? Let them go out in the streets and get hit by a car. Let them take drugs, you know. I, I can just, I really get upset about some of the ideas these maintenance people have. Well, just some of the things that are happening there when you come to Seattle, you can get involved. Then we thought of a sundial up on top of the mound. Getting back to primitive cosmic relations, man to the universe, and how about you being the center of the universe? So this is an autonomic sundial in which the mayor is standing there now. This is, this is the mayor that ran on the program of tearing everything down. And now he's a big supporter of the park. And we, use, we give him political credence out of it. We let him dedicate the sundial. So there he is, and his shadow is the center of his universe, and it's telling very accurately what time it is. All worked out on the computers and the moon also. You can read time by the moon on this particular dial. And this is a detail, one of the zodiacal, uh, zodiac characters. It's a mosaic. And the center city people are, are bust in, the children are bust in, and uh, they did this mural behind here. And I was very skeptical about this, you know. Uh, here comes a fine artist with these kids, and they're going to paint a mural. And look at that. I think it's fantastic. It's, they really caught the spirit of the place. It's in the right uh, 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 scale and color. Look at them there. What city in the world would have geese grazing in the background like that, huh? 
So I didn't get my winged rats, but I'm getting geese instead. Some of the things that are happening. And these remain my next target. These towers, I've got to get into them, and I think I'll separate one first and do the camera obscura and slowly work a way in. And so, because I want people in, on, over, around, under, through, get engaged with these towers, and it's it's going to happen. They're fenced in now. We did have a trespassing uh, young boy fell off from a 30-foot height and uh, sued the city, the, the, sued the contractor. The contractor then named the city, and the city then named me as the designer. So there are three co-defendants for a $1.5 million lawsuit. We won the case. No damages were awarded. Well, that's the way it was, and that's the way it's becoming. I think that's about it. Yeah. Thank you. George Bernard Shaw once, uh, I think he was one of the last geniuses that came around, and he made a statement once that I very, uh, have read, would like to quote, and he said, that every idea goes through four stages. And the first time the idea is brought up, it's impossible. That's just impossible. And the second time it's brought up, it gets a response like, um, yeah, but it costs too much. The third time it's brought up, it's socialistic or communistic or anti-Christ, one or all three of the above. The fourth time it's brought up, hmm, yeah, well, I was for that all the time, you know. I think I'm almost at that point. I'm just expecting, after it's published next month in Life magazine and all, that the local newspapers are going to say, well, we were for that all the time. Remember all the good support we gave you? Remember? Thanks, Gab. If you have questions, if you have patience and time. <laughs> Absolutely. We have a reception copy of the cookies outside in the exhibition area.